those who had intermarried the Israelites during the northern kingdom period, intermarried with some of the Edomites there, and even some Assyrians and Ammonites. And so they, they created this mixed race of, of half Hebrew, half Gentile, and they were not uh, well looked upon. They were despised. There was a great deal of, of prejudice and racism going on against the Samaritans. But Jesus often went through Samaria, and he interacted with Samaritans quite frequently. So he goes to Jerusalem, as, or as he's going to Jerusalem, he passes through Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Of course, the disease of leprosy is a flesh-eating disease. Uh, it's said that lepers can, in the middle of the night, have digits fall off of their hands, toes fall off of their feet. Uh, rodents will feast upon uh, these things, and they won't even notice it because there's no sensitivity any longer in the skin. It's just a corruption in the flesh that the flesh eats itself away. It's highly contagious disease. So uh, here these 10 lepers, they cry to Jesus from afar off. They can't come near to him. They even had to declare when they would approach uh, a group of people, unclean, unclean, so people could steer clear of them. And they lift up their voice, verse 13, and said to uh, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So what they're asking him to do is heal them of their leprosy. Verse 14, and when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that, look here, as they went, they were cleansed. All right, so let's back up, just give you the cliff notes again. Jesus is passing through the village. Ten lepers see him. They cry to him from afar off, and they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He sees them, and he tells them, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, the priest had the ability to determine if someone was sick or if they were not. And the priest made the determination. He's almost a pseudo-doctor, if you will. Uh, God told Moses what the priest should be looking for, and they had a bit of training in this, this uh, area. And so they, they could tell when leprosy was coming on someone, they could tell when it was departing, as well as other maladies and, and problems that people would have with their health. And so they were supposed to go show themselves to the priest so the priest could declare them healed or cured or clean in the case of a leper. And so that's why Jesus tells them, go show yourself to the priest. So they obey Christ and they begin to go show themselves to him. And it says here, as they went, they were cleansed. So here's how it didn't happen. It didn't happen by Jesus saying, you want me to have mercy on you? Okay, you're healed. Take a look at yourself, you're healed, now go show yourselves to the priest and he'll declare you healed. Didn't happen that way. He just said, you guys want healed? Go show yourselves to the priests. And their willingness to act in faith by obeying him and going to the priest is what caused them to be cleansed. That's why it says, as they went, they were cleansed. Does that make sense to you? Good. Verse number 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. So here are 10 lepers. Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. As they went, seems to be inclusive, all 10 of them are going. One of them realizes, hey, we were cleansed. He turns back and he goes to Jesus and verse number 16, he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks and he was a Samaritan. So we're let that, that's known so that we understand that here's a guy who should have been the outcast, but he's the one who's coming back to the Lord. 
verse number 17. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Now, we don't know what happened to them beyond this. We talked about it in the Sunday school uh, meeting tonight even. Uh, the supposition is they never came back to say thank you. The question was asked, well, maybe they went to the priest in obedience and then were declared clean and then came and found Jesus again. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that only one of them returned. That's what we're to gather from this story here. Only one of the ten came back. Here, let me, now let, let me bring it into modern day here. Uh, weren't there ten saved? Where are the nine? You do that. I do that. You know why we do it? James chapter 2. Don't tell me you're saved. Show me you're saved. Right? You say you're saved, and you tell me you're saved by your faith. You show me your faith, I'll show you my works. See, if someone came to me and said, prove to me that you're saved, I would say, look at my life. Doesn't it back up my testimony? That would be my proof to you. There are other people, though, we ask them, hey, do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? And they say, you know what, I do. I was saved when I was eight years old in Sunday school class. Oh, wonderful. Where do you attend church? I don't. Uh, you know, where do you tithe? I don't. When's the last time you read your Bible? I don't. When's the last time you prayed? I don't know. They can't answer any of those questions. You know what we like to do then? Oh, okay, it's clear. I am saved. You are not. How many lepers got cleansed? Ten. How many came back? One. Were there not ten cleansed? Yeah. Where are the nine? We don't know. What Jesus is teaching us here is that they don't all show back up. Now there is a theology or a, a position held called lordship salvation. That's number one on your blank sheet there. Lordship salvation salvation lordship salvation is the belief that until a person makes jesus the lord of their life they cannot be saved now let me before we continue on there's a, another story in the bible you know it well you know it based on the the man paying the penny for a wage remember that story so some people, they pull the truck up to the front of the Home Depot and say, I need three guys, and the three guys jump in the truck, and uh, it probably doesn't play here, does it? It played in Atlanta, man. We'd do that all the time. We'd pull the truck up, illegal immigrants hanging out in front of the Home Depot. I need four guys. Who knows concrete? I need four concrete guys. In the truck they are. And uh, we'd pull up there. Sometimes we'd be halfway through the day. we say, man, we've got another 15 yards of concrete to pour and trowel out. Uh, go back to Home Depot and get five more guys. And so that's what this, this uh, laborer is doing, right? He goes to the Home Depot and he gets uh, some laborers at 6 a.m. And he promises to pay him a penny. And then he comes back at 9 a.m. and he says, I'll pay you what's fair. And it does, he doesn't say what. So he gets more guys at 9 a.m., he gets more guys at noon, he gets more guys at 3, then he goes back and gets a few more guys at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Then when it's payday, or time to pay them, uh, the Israelites would pay every single day. They didn't get paid weekly paychecks, they got paid every day. And so the 5 o'clock guy showed up and he got a penny. And so everybody else in line was like, wow, he, got, he worked an hour and got a penny. We were told a penny, and we started working at 6 o'clock this morning. I bet we're going to get paid way more than that. But then the guy at 3 o'clock, they get pennies. And the guy at noon, they got pennies. And the guy at 9 got pennies, and the guy at 6 a.m., they all got pennies. And the guys that worked more hours were angry at the boss. They said, how, how can you pay these guys the same wage you pay us when we worked all day for you? And the master says, is it not lawful for me to do that which I will with what is mine? He says, I can pay people whatever I want to pay them. 
Now, what that story is teaching is salvation. It doesn't matter when someone gets saved, they go to heaven. Some people get saved when they're five years old, and they serve God their whole lives. Other people get saved when they're 30, and they start serving God from 30. Other people serve God when they get, or they get saved at 50, and they'll serve God till they're dead. Some people get saved the week of their death. Remember Rob Reynolds? I led him to Christ four hours before he died. That's called clocking in at 5 p.m. right there. And so here's what God's saying. Rob Reynolds didn't serve me one minute of his life. He still gets to go to heaven. Why? Because it's God's mercy to do whatever he wants to do with it. Right? We get, I got saved at 15. How many got saved as a, as a single age child? Like six, seven, eight. Yeah, a bunch of you. Man, you're going to be really mad at those people that got in at the last minute, aren't you? Uh, Lord, I, I got saved young. And uh, any, what, here's, here's that, that whole parable is about salvation. And here's what the parable teaches us. It's not our call. I get as frustrated as you get. I see people that, that sincerely accept Christ, but then they don't want to do anything with their life for the Lord. They won't show up to church even one time. They won't get baptized, and that's frustrating. And I even say to myself, well, you know what? Maybe they didn't mean it. But I'll be honest with you, that's not my call to make. And I try not to make that call. But it's hard in the flesh because James 2 is true. The only way I can tell if you're saved or not is by your life. Right? It's the only way you can tell I'm saved. Now, we can give you our testimonies, but if our life doesn't back up our testimony, we really have doubts about that. In fact, I've, I've been with soul winners before that, uh, you know, they're standing at the door and, you know, they got, guy's got a tattoo on his arm that says Satan rules and, and, and he'll tell you, no, I'm saved. I got saved as a little boy, you know, and there he's chugging a 40 ounce of Budweiser and smoking a marijuana joint with a Satan rules tattoo. Yeah, no, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm going, hey, <laughs> you sure don't look like it, buddy. And I know soul winners who will say, you know what? Why don't we just make sure of that fact? <laughs> and they'll, they'll witness to them, and they'll even try to get them to pray, and sometimes they'll get people to pray again. Now, first off, I don't know. I have no idea about any of that. And again, I don't even care, to be quite frank with you. It's not my problem, not my place. I'm told to preach the gospel, and that's all I'm told to do. God waters. I'm sorry, no, we don't. We water, we plant, we water, God gives the increase. When Samuel went to Jesse's house to try to decide who the next king of Israel was, he looked at Eliab and said, this is the guy, sure as the world. And the Lord said, that's not him. He's like, really? Because he's the tallest and the strongest and the handsomest. And I seen Saul and I know what you tend to pick, God. This looks like the guy. You sure? Eliab? No, not him. And this is what the Lord told Samuel. Man's, the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And he does that for salvation too. Now you and I, we don't have a choice but to look at the outside. You know, if, if, if I got a guy who says, you know, I'd like to be on staff at the church. And I go, really? With your Satan rules tattoo and your Budweiser and your marijuana, right? Sorry, you're not going to be on. But I'm saved. Well, you know what? Good for you. I'm glad you claim salvation, but you're not on staff because I can't verify the fact that you're saved based on your life. And you know what? That's fair of me to do. I have a right to judge in areas for which I'm responsible, right? As do you. Like, you know, if Nicole brought that dude home wanting to get married to him, right? Where is Nicole? I don't even see her. She's hiding out. Uh, so uh, she brings him home. I say, veto, not marrying this guy, right? She's probably out with him right now for all I know. But uh, <laughs> I veto because that's within my area of responsibility. 
But the truth is, he might be saved. I don't know his heart. God knows his heart. Ten lepers were cleansed. Nine of them didn't show back up. They were still cleansed. We win people to Christ all the time who make professions of faith. We don't know. And the best thing for us to do is just leave it in the hands of God. So let's talk about this matter of lordship salvation. What is lordship salvation? Lordship salvation is an overcorrection. Then this isn't in your notes. Uh, it's an overcorrection of an unwillingness to just let God deal with it. I've told you before that Green Beret motto, kill them all, let God sort them out, right? It sounds like a Green Beret, doesn't it? Uh, I like to say, win them all, let God sort them out. You know, and I'm not trying to lead people to false professions. I don't lead people to false professions. If someone says to me, you know, I'm not ready to do that, I say, then I don't want to try to get you to do it. I'm not here to get you to pray a prayer with me. I'm here to show you what Jesus did for you. And I will encourage you to take him up on his offer of forgiveness and salvation. But I'm not going to make you do it. I'm not going to twist your arm. And I've seen guys do that too. You know what? Let's just pray together. Just, you know, let's just pray together. And then while they're praying, they'll just kind of slip in the sinner's prayer. And I don't go for that. I think someone has to say yes to Jesus to be saved. Uh, odd concept, I know, but it is in the Bible there. At the same time, if someone does say yes to Jesus, it's not my place to then say, yeah, they didn't mean that. I can't take either of those positions. I can't coerce them to do it, nor should I deny their testimony if they give it to me. That makes sense? Uh, so lordship salvation is a position that says, you know what, unless we can see fruit in your life, we're not going to take your testimony at face value. So let me get back into the notes so you can start moving down your sheet here. Lordship salvation is the belief that a person, uh, that until a person makes Jesus Lord of their life, they cannot be saved. Now this attacks soul winning because they say you cannot lead someone to Christ and have them pray the sinner's prayer for salvation. That's why churches come up with this we're going to watch you for three months before we let you get baptized. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. Nowhere in the Bible are we encouraged to do that. Nowhere in the Bible do we see a church doing that. When did the people who got saved at Pentecost get baptized? Same day. Same day. How about in chapter 4 when 5,000 people got saved? When did they get baptized? Same day. No one waited. No one took a class. If you really want to get down to brass tacks, I, I'm not even uh, sure biblically that it's taught. You even have to understand what baptism is. Here's what baptism is. Christian, people who believe in Jesus get in the water. That's pretty much what it is. Now, yes, it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Yes, it pictures the death of the old man and the resurrection and the newness of life. If I asked you, though, how many of you knew that when you got baptized? Half of you'd lie, and then the other half would make an excuse for it. You didn't know that either. In fact, some of you might have just heard it for the first time just now. So let's not act like people have to be Bible college graduates to get baptized. We're going to watch you for six months before we'll let you have membership into the church. When did the people who got saved at, baptized, uh, at Pentecost get added to the church? Same day. Because baptism adds you to the church. Huh? You see how we like to interfere with God's work? Look, man, you know what we are? We're farmhands. Go plant the seed and go water it and shut your mouth. That's our job. Well, we like to sit at the, de at the table with the board. God says, I'm the only one at the table. Go plant the seed. It's not our job. We take too much upon ourselves. Do you remember when Korah came to Moses and said, Moses, you've taken too much upon yourself. And then later on, Moses said to Korah, you've taken too much upon yourself. God can say that to us. This whole Calvinism bit, that's man taking too much upon himself. God's chosen who's been saved and, and who's not. That's ridiculous. That's heresy. And so to make Jesus Lord of your life means to submit to him 
in every area of your life. Now, I hate to be the bearer of bad news tonight, but there's not a person in this room that's made Jesus the Lord of their entire life. And so here, let me give you some more. Letter B, in order to, for a person to be saved, they must make Jesus the Lord of their life. Now, this is the position of the Lordship salvation. That's not Bible teaching. If this is the case, then no one is saved because Jesus is not truly the Lord of anyone's life entirely. Now, you may have given him some surrender, but there's not a person in here fully surrendered at all times of the day. And so what happens, and we're going to get to it in a minute, if, if they commit the same sins that I commit, well, they could still be saved because I'm saved and I commit those sins. But if they commit sins that I don't commit, then they might not be saved because I'm saved and I don't do that. You see how, how tricky it gets. And that's where self-righteousness comes in too because we're all dirty, rotten, filthy sinners. Every one of us are. Just some of us sin in different ways than others of us sin. And then there's Rick who sins in all the ways. So it's easy for us, you know, I don't smoke cigarettes, but you do, so na na boo boo, I'm going to go tell God on you. Yeah, but they might smoke cigarettes, but I've seen you at Thanksgiving dinner put away about 8,000 calories, and that's called gluttony, and that's equally the sin of smoking. Both of them are harmful to the body. Yeah, we don't like it when people talk about gluttony, do we? It's the only sin that Baptists like to participate in unscathed. <laughs> Until we're rid of our fleshly bodies, we're unable to make Jesus the Lord of our life. First John verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So what this verse is telling us is that currently we are the sons of God, but we are not what we will someday be. Perfect, mature, sinless even. We won't get there until we see him. Lordship salvation wants to say, until you get there, you can't even be saved. But this verse says that we already are saved even though we're not there. See, the problem with lordship salvation is it negates any possibility of growth. That's like a doctor delivering a baby, provided uh, his or her mother or father didn't choose to have him aborted. I'm still not over it, you can tell. Uh, that baby's born, and then you look at it and say, you know, this isn't a real human being. It's not a fully functioning adult. Same thing. Somebody gets saved, and, and they didn't win 15 people to Christ that first week, and you're like, I don't think they meant it. How many people did you win to Christ your first week, or year, or decade, or ever? People grow in different areas than others. You know, I, I, I watched uh, people when they get saved and, and, and how God starts to work on them about certain things. And you know what the Holy Spirit does? He works on different people in different areas at different times. Sometimes things don't occur to people forever. Sometimes it takes a guest speaker for it to occur to them, and that really irks me. Because that guest speaker will come in and they'll preach on something and, and that person will come to the altar that I know uh, the Lord has needed to deal with that. And then that person will come to me, Pastor, thank you for having them in. I tell you what, that sermon changed my life. And I look there and go, I'm so glad that it did. <laughs> I've been preaching that same thing to you for five years and you haven't heard it once. But you let some stranger blow in from out of town with a briefcase and all of a sudden he's the expert. Anyways... Romans chapter 7, verse 18, this is Paul, we read this Sunday night, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Is Paul saved here, yes or no? Yeah. yeah. And what does he say about dwelling in him and in his flesh? No good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Paul said, I don't even know how to overcome this sin. 
Do you also know that it's possible people might be struggling with a sin? They just haven't told you about it. And I'll tell you why they haven't told you about it, because it's not any of your business. Huh? Uh, here's some good advice. It, it's all right to let people know that you have feet of clay. Just don't ever take your shoes off. You don't have to tell everybody what your weaknesses are. We know you have weaknesses. And it's one thing if you want to have someone as an accountability partner. But you don't have to run around telling everybody what all your dirty laundry is. We had a lady one time ask Shannon and I over to her house, would you please come over, Pastor? I need to confess some sin to you. I said, ma'am, I am not a priest. And you don't have to confess any sin to me. And she said, it would make me feel so much better if I did. And I said, I don't really want you to. I'd rather not know what you did. Did you already confess it to the Lord? Yes, I have. But it's going to make me feel so much better to confess it to you. I said, it shouldn't because I can't do anything for you about this. Only God can forgive sin and I'm not God and, and I'd rather not even know. She insisted on telling us. We didn't want to know. And she laid it out there and I, I said, you never had to tell us that. I just want you to know that. She left the church within a month. You know why? I knew mu too much about her. You don't have to tell people your dirty laundry. And it's one thing to get counsel. It's one thing to have accountability partners. That's all fine. And, and for the record, any pastoral counseling that I would do or that Shannon and I would do, uh, if you're a lady or a married couple, that doesn't leave us. That is locked in, what do they call that, privileged information or whatever uh, you want to call it. And, and, and for the record, there's no judgment. Here's another thing. If you knew what I've been told, you'd know what an easy case you are. <laughs> And that's as far as I'm going down that road. You have no idea what people have told me through the years. And whatever you got, I promise you, it's nothing like what I've already heard. <laughs> Let's keep moving here. Letter E. We, of course, we should all be making a sincere effort toward making Jesus Lord of our lives. So I don't want you to get the idea, because th this is what people who are non-baptistic in their theology say, oh, if I believed in eternal security, I'd get saved and then live however I wanted to. Well, the truth is, if you trust Christ as Savior and, and you start reading the Bible and going to church, that statement is not true. Right. I don't want to live however I want to. I want to live in a way that pleases him. Why? Because I love him. Shannon and I are married. We've been married 20, almost 29 years. Rewards in heaven for her, no doubt. And the truth is, I live in a free country. I'm a grown man. I could go do whatever I want to do tonight. But there's a lot of stuff that I will not do because I love her. I made a commitment to her. We are husband and wife. All other women are off the planet for me from this point forward, period. And I do that by choice. Likewise, when I trusted Christ, he saved my soul eternally. And you know what? I could go sin in whatever manner I wanted to tonight. But I don't want to. Because I love him. And when you get saved, your love for the Lord surpasses your desire to intentionally engage in any sinful lifestyle. It's just what comes with the relationship. Does that make sense? But non-baptistic people will say, oh, you'll just live however you want. That's not true, and that's not what we're getting at here. We're not saying that because you're not saved by the, a lifestyle that backs up your testimony, you should do whatever you want. No, you should be growing. If anybody puts pressure on you to grow, is this pulpit. Man, we don't play games around here. Probably if I'd lighten up, we might grow a little faster or better or whatever you want to say. But when, the way that I see the word of God, there's no time for letting up. That's why 56% of people voted for abortions in the state of Michigan yesterday. Without parental consent for teenagers. You kidding me? It's murder. Partial birth abortion. Deliver the head of the baby. 
at a full term and kill it? It's Bill Clinton's thing right there. He got that ball rolling. Next. Okay, uh, Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. The psalmist is speaking of heaven here, of the, re- the full process of redemption. So what he's saying is, I'm not there yet. And what lordship salvation does is it removes any possibility for growth. It expects full maturity in order for salvation to have occurred. And not just full maturity, but perfection. Which is not even a reality. Uh, There is only one gospel, letter F. Galatians chapter 1. If you can turn there quickly. I'm running out of time. I don't want to hold you too late here. Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 6. Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. There is only one gospel. What is the book of Galatians about? It's about a group of Christians in the, in the city of Galatia, a church there, where the Judaizers were coming in and saying, you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the Sabbath day, and there's some points of the law that you have to keep in order to be saved. They're adding works to salvation, just like we talked about the last two weeks with the Roman Catholic Church, adding works to salvation. That is not the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the atonement of the sins of man which is received through faith in Jesus Christ that's the gospel and there is no other gospel than that so if you start saying well you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life to be saved you've just changed the gospel and you've added works to it basically there are two kinds of salvation only one of which is correct by the way God does it or man does it. The salvation that God does is real and biblical and true. The salvation that man does does not exist. And if you seek to save yourself through your own actions, you'll die and go to hell and burn forever because you must put faith in Christ and not in you. When God does it, it's called done When we do it, it's called do. Any belief that has ourselves or anyone else doing something for salvation is false. Jesus is the only one that saves. Letter G. If there's anything that we can do to save ourselves or to help save ourselves, or if there's anything that another person or group of people can do to save us, then salvation is not of grace. Does that make sense? If you add any human effort to salvation, you've just negated grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we quoted it uh, last couple weeks. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans chapter 11, verse number 6. And if by grace then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Did you catch that? Okay, good. It's in the Bible if you need it again. Letter H. David was saved when Jesus was not the Lord of his life. Let me ask you a question. Do you think David was a saved man? 
He's a man after God's own heart. Was David saved when he committed adultery with Bathsheba? He was. Was he saved when he had Uriah murdered? Yes. I'm going to guess the Lordship Salvation people wouldn't have thought David was saved. Why? Because those works don't back up salvation. And by the way, they don't back up salvation. The truth of the matter is, there's a list of people in the Bible that many of us wouldn't even feel comfortable with having members of this church. You wouldn't want Noah here. Oh, the boat builder? No, the drunk. He got drunk after he built the boat. You wouldn't want David here. Oh, the lowly shepherd boy that killed Goliath? No, the murderous adulterer. He did that after he killed Goliath. You wouldn't want Peter here. He just cussed everybody out by the fire and denied the Lord. <laughs> not going to have him around here. Not going to have Jonah around here, that rebel right. running away from God. Not going to have him here. Huh? All kinds of people. We just say, you don't get to come around. You know why? Because we think we're more spiritual than they are. I got news for you. We're going to be behind all those guys at the judgment seat of Christ. We're not even going to be close to them. We're going to be like, is that David? No, he's like eight miles ahead of us. <laughs> Letter G. No, I already read that. E? 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 All right. Whatever. David was saved when Jesus was not the Lord of his life. Psalm 51. Do you know Psalm 51? What is Psalm 51? Anybody know? David's prayer of confession and repentance. Look what he says. Verse number 12 of Psalm 51. Restore unto me my salvation. Oh, the joy of his salvation. So he didn't lose his salvation when he sinned with Bathsheba. He lost the joy of it, but he didn't lose the salvation. He had Uriah killed. Man, that's a close call. You know, 1 John says no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. David came pretty close. You, you stand before a judge with that evidence, you might get tried, right? I don't know, is that second degree? Is it, is it a conspiracy to commit? I don't know the law. But he's close to that line. But he was saved when those things happened. Was God pleased? No. Was he in the right place spiritually? No. Was he saved? Yes. Next letter. D, E, he is an elephant. Lot, Lot, let me find, I need this. E, Lot was saved when Jesus was not the Lord of his life. Second Peter chapter number 2. I should have wrote these out for time. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 7. And delivered, what's that next word? Just lot. What does that mean, just lot? It means justified. Justification is the occurrence of, at salvation. So just lot means saved lot. He delivered just lot. Let's go back to verse 6. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. You know what that means? Living like the wicked. You don't live with the wicked like Lot was without living like the wicked. That's why some Christians voted for abortion yesterday. 
We lost everything, all three proposals. Yes, yes, yes. I voted no, 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 and yes, yes, yes. All right. God gives the people the leaders they deserve. Don't you wish you lived in Florida? Anyway, for that righteous man, what? Verse 8, that righteous man, who? Lot. Lot. Righteous? We just said that he was living like the wicked. Was he righteous in his lifestyle? No. He was righteous in his position before God. Scary. Where am I? Was Lot saved? Yes. Was Jesus the Lord of Lot's life? No. He is called just and righteous, but he was living in Sodom. He was sitting in the gates. He was calling the perverse homosexual crowd his brothers. He offered his single daughters to those men to do whatever they wanted with them. He didn't want to leave Sodom when the angel told him that it was going to be destroyed. And then he ended up fathering two incestuous children with his two daughters. Righteous Lot. Not in my world. But in God's world. Guess who matters most? Where are the nine? They're in Sodom. They're warming their hands by the fire, denying the Lord. See, sometimes it's our own pride that looks in judgment at sinful people and says, they can't be saved. You know that there's a lot of people in the ranks above you that could just as easily look at you and say, I don't care if he goes to church or not. <laughs> He's not saved. Ay, ay, ay. Noah, letter J. I'm just saying that to irritate Ellen at this point. Noah, was he saved? Yes. yes. Was Jesus the Lord of his life? It's also hard for these people to make Jesus the Lord of their life when they didn't even know who he was. They knew of a Messiah. They didn't know who he was. Verse 8, Genesis chapter 6, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, Noah got drunk in his tent, and his son stumbled upon him in his nakedness and did something, and we don't want to know and we don't care to know. He was saved in chapter 6. Guess where else he's saved? Chapter 9. He saved building the ark. He saved drunk in his tent. I'm not for it. I'm not saying that. I'm not on the side of drunk Noah. I think he, he has that stain on his record. I'm not saying, oh, you know, hey, we're all saved. Go do whatever you want tonight. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is people can be saved and not live up to what you and I think they should be living up to. And then to say, well, they have to in order for me to really believe they're saved, that's lordship salvation. And that'll keep us from spreading the gospel as zealously as we should. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Corinthian church, pretty spiritual church, right? No, thank you, Rick. I was hoping no one would say, yeah. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am Paul, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? And you may as well throw in there, I wonder if you're even saved. People can be carnal and still saved. They shouldn't be carnal, but they can be. These people walked as men according to the flesh and not as spiritual. 
Letter L, Ellen. <laughs> Babes in Christ are saved, but Jesus is not the Lord of their life. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If there's an opportunity for growth, there's no such thing as lordship salvation. Because lordship salvation is perfection and maturity. And if you have to make Jesus Lord of your life, and by the way, you'll see this out there. You have to be very careful. If you, if you, if you read these books that come out of the Christian bookstores that are, you know, national type places, uh, you watch the TV preachers, and you hear someone say, now if you're willing to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. I know people who have been saved decades still aren't ready to make Jesus their Lord. They've accepted him as their Savior, but Lord, I don't think so. It's true. You know them too. They walk amongst us. They might even be here right now. Let's move on for time. 2 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also has suffered. Nope, that's 1 Peter, sorry. 2 Peter 3, 18. I always get in trouble when I hurry. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. The fact that a Christian can grow in grace is proof that lordship salvation does not exist. M. A person can be righteous in the sight of God and be saved without making Jesus Lord of his life. Romans chapter 4. A person can be righteous in the sight of God and be saved without making Jesus Lord of his life. Romans chapter 4, verse number 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Why is this guy counted righteousness? Or righteous? faith. What about his works? It's not in here. To him that worketh not. To make Jesus Lord of your life, you're putting in work. See, it's, it's two separate things. It's salvation and sanctification. What Lordship Salvation teaches is that salvation does not come apart from sanctification, but it indeed does. If the two came together, there'd be no such thing as growth. That's what the last point was about with the babes in Christ, First and Second Peter. Is this making sense? Okay. I'm trying to hurry now, and I don't want to leave things out. Letter N. A person can be saved and not have his body totally yielded to Christ. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1. You know these verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That sounds like something that someone who has Jesus as Lord of their life should be doing. Would you agree? If someone has Jesus as the Lord of their life, should their mind be renewed? Yeah. Should they be transformed personally? Yeah. Should they not be conformed to this world? Then why is Paul telling these brethren to do these things? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, if, if you have to have done these things in order to be saved, how can you be called a brother? You can't. 
See, the problem with Lordship Salvation folks and those who lean real heavily on the repentance side of salvation, meaning repentance means to turn from sins uh, and give up sins in order to be saved. Well, first off, that's works. You better be careful. Secondly, which sins do you have to give up? The ones that you don't commit? Or how about the ones that you do commit? Meaning you're now not saved because you didn't give them up. We do a lot of cherry picking here. Let's hurry. We got to be done. Letter O. A person can be saved and call Jesus Lord without him actually being Lord of that life. This is the real fun one. Chapter 6 of the book of Luke. So here these people call Jesus Lord and he's not the Lord of their life. Luke chapter 6 verse number 20 and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Verse 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Do you have a red letter Bible? Where do the red letters begin? Verse 20. And it's all red, all red to 46. So is it fair to say that everything that's read between verses 20 and 46, he's talking to the same group of people? Who's he talking to in verse 20? His disciples. Are disciples saved or lost? Saved. What do they do? They call him Lord and they don't do the things that he says. Imagine that. So how do you then say to someone... Except you make Jesus Lord of your life, you can't be saved. That's an impossibility, friend. We all come to Christ on our faces, sinful and desperately wicked. And we just appeal to his mercy. And our faith in Jesus is what he uses to save us. And then, he picks us up and he starts dusting us off and gives us a new pair of shoes and gives us a new jacket. And then he, he cleans us up some more and he sits down and he teaches us and he works with us. And the longer we walk this path, the cleaner we become. But you don't get to the end of that and say, okay, now you're saved. No, you got saved way back here. And that's the process of sanctification. Let's hurry. Our goal ought to be submitting and surrendering our lives to him more and more each day. We ought to be striving to make him Lord of our lives in every area. But to say that one cannot be saved until this happens means two things. Either no one's saved or salvation is by works. Does that make sense? Now, it's easy, and I know, and I do it too, especially with folks that I really, really thought got it, if you know what I mean, but we just don't know. Our job is twofold. Plant water, plant water, plant water. Hey, boss, I don't think that this is growing the way that it ought to. Plant and water, leave the growth to me. God will handle it. He doesn't need our help. Let's just be faithful to plant and water. Ushers, come on down. Let's receive our offering, please. Please be faithful and generous in your giving. First offering of the month last week was helpful. 3,400, I think, came in. And I think we're just over.